it's week 15 and we're still here. We're, we're rocking and rolling. Press coverage is back. And, you know, it, it's starting to get to be like an established show because I'm getting repeat guests coming back in the mix. I got my man, Andrew Cooper from Fantasy Alarm. One of the sharp ones out there putting out ridiculous content all season long. We podcast together so many times now. It's like the back of my hand. I almost didn't even send him a show sheet today because I was like, I'm just going to keep him on his toes. But a Andrew, you've crushed it this season. Uh, let everybody know what you have going on and and the really you know great work you're putting out there at Fantasy Alarm and a couple of other spots this year too. Let everybody know where they can yeah. find you. First and foremost, I'm trying to set the record for the most appearances on the Roto Underworld Player Profiler channel. It's too this hard. Year. John Daigle, John Daigle, and Josh Larkey. Those guys have been on so many times. You're gonna have to if you want to make it happen. I'm gonna book you like five straight weeks. I, and you, you might have to. I did. I jumped on with Matt. I jumped on with Billy. I even jumped on with Dario to try and boost yes, my numbers yes. up. Right when the van yes. when he came by. So I've it's been trying cloud. to get those numbers up, dude. I'm trying to get them up. Uh, but yeah, if people want my stuff, it's all at Fantasy Alarm, Fantasy Alarm YouTube. Follow me on Twitter at Coupe Fiasco. I post everything there. Uh, but yeah, that's where I post the tight end rankings every week, the snap count stuff. My my rankings for every position are up there, but the tight end rankings I make free just because I kind of made a promise to the people who have read it and Twitter that I would do that. So uh, the tight end stuff is always free. The rest of it, though, that's paywall for our guys. And uh, Fantasy Alarm people are crushing it, man. Every, every week in the Discord, we have people throwing – you know, DFS things are taken down. And not just for football, man. Our MMA guy – it's crazy. Our MMA guy, he's winning like every other week in the list contest. We also have the the NASCAR, our NASCAR writer, Matt Sells, has won the NASCAR writer of the year three out of the last four years. So we got guys over there. But uh, yeah, find all my stuff right there. Coupe Fiasco. Bro. Now, are you an MMA guy or a NASCAR guy? I feel like I, so you're I, from like you're like a Boston area guy and every Boston area person thinks they know about like fighting and uh, or boxing or MMA. So I'm guessing you got to like a little yeah. bit into it. It's like, you know, the Brockton city of champions. Yeah. You got that too. But I'm no, really... I mean, for the, for the funny thing is I actually, there's no NASCAR fans up here except for like me and my brother-in-law. Like we go to the races in New Hampshire. I root for my boy, Kyle Busch. Dude, I had to pick Kyle Busch because everyone hates him. So I figured if I'm already going to be a uh, New England fan, might as well just pick pick the best driver that everyone hates. So yeah, no. And, and with the MMA stuff, I really just go by our guy, Mike's picks. So uh, I don't know. Did you get into that stuff? And it, it, the thing is, it's so fun to watch when you got money on it dude, because it's like in all these other sports, of course, there's like a walk off home run. Right. And like or an overtime goal. Like th those are electric moments. But when a dude gets knocked out and then you make a bunch of money, can you really beat that dude? Just like, bam, pay me. You know, so it is kind of sick. Yeah. You know, I, I feel like I'm like a little bit more of a boxing. Like I'll watch an MMA, MMA fight if it's like a really big one and there's like people getting together, but I'll tell you what, Coop, you're, you're a, you're a father. You know how it is. Like those, the fight doesn't start going doesn't start until like late. so late. So like us East coast, uh, East coast people, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a bad vibe when you, when the, the main fight starts at like 1130 at night. And then like, it's cool to watch a knockout, but once in a while you get a fight that's like a minute and you're right. like, man, I waited <laughs> up and I'm now saying, it's like 1230. Dude. So, you know, um, you got to be careful with that. Trust me. I do a lot of bootlegging because of that, for that exact reason, I will say. So shout out, shout out FBI, shout out, shout out. Um, <laughs> shout so out, Coop, you know, one thing that you tweeted today that kind of really resonated with me, you know, you're putting out and, and first of all, like Coop can, can discuss any position, um, you know, at with, with anybody like, you know, your stuff, but you've gotten this reputation, um, for tight ends and you become sort of like a tight end whisperer, uh, somebody who's really made a, a, his stamp in the industry with just being so on point with your tight ends. And you have a, a weekly must read article. And this year it's been like the epitome of it, of it. It's success wise, where you write the yin and yang tight end article. It's a weekly article. Like you discussed you, your tight end uh, rankings are free, but you tweeted out, I think it was today or yesterday about how this has been like a perfect year for it. Why don't you tell everybody your kind of your thoughts on that? Yeah, and I think this is the year, honestly, because of how good it's been this year, that we might see a flip moving forward. We've been able to take so much advantage of this. We, I've been calling it yin-yang tight end, which is you wait on tight end, and instead of drafting – just one, you draft two. You draft the safest possible guy and the highest risk, high reward guy. And then if you hit, great, right? Like Sam Laporta, if you drafted him, 
then you just hit right away and you're good, right? If you don't hit, you keep rotating guys through on the bench until you do hit, right? And going back through time, you know, you've had the Konami code, you've had the zero RB, these new strategies that people didn't really utilize, right? Until it all started panning out and making sense and people started winning. This is the year where I think you're going to look around at the people that joined us for once. Like we've been doing it for years. It's how we hit on Mark Andrews, how we hit on Darren Waller, Logan Thomas, because people weren't just drafting them as their only tight end. You're not going to wait till and take just tight end 50, 15 Mark Andrews and make him your tight end, right? So that's what we're doing is we're taking two so that we can take shots on those high risk, high reward guys. And this year, you look at my followers and you talk to my followers, and you talk to people on Reddit, right? You see Uncle Ted in the chat right there. Ferguson and Schultz, there's two tight ends, yin and yang, right? Schultz is in the article. Njoku is in the article. Kincaid, Laporta, McBride, all these guys. You go and talk to my followers now, and while people are out there struggling at tight end, they're, they're asking questions like, do I start Sam Laporta or Trey McBride this week? Do I start Isaiah Likely or Dalton Kincaid? Guy tight ends that are top five or six that nobody really besides us had ranked top 12, maybe Kincaid, right? But you had to hold on to him. And using this strategy, it lets you do that, right? Evan, our top pairing was Evan Ingram and Dalton Kincaid this year. How do you think that's worked out for people, Theo? Listen, you ran pure. and you, You've had a number of hits in years past, which you mentioned. And I think I'll take it even a step further. You know, the tight end position right now is so strong heading into the fantasy playoffs that you might see some of these overall winners whether it's you know the FFPC main event or an underdog uh, or or an NFFC, where you know in years past, I, Scott Barrett tweeted about the, this week. Shout out to Scott, who's been right here on press coverage before, um, about how it's usually kind of a low EV move in a non tight end premium to go with the tight end in the flex spot. But like you mentioned, there's a lot of these teams that are so supercharged at tight end heading into you know ch- you know the championship big money weeks where you can build a really strong lineup with two tight ends, even if you don't have like a Travis Kelsey or a Sam Laporta. Right. You know, there's a number of guys we're going to talk about shortly, but it really seems like it's kind of a perfect storm year. And these are not even on the show sheet, but we're going to kind of go rapid fire on a couple of tight end uh, thoughts I have. Next year, where does Travis Kelsey end up in redraft? I don't think he's seeing the first round. I think it's finally going to catch up to him. Where do you see him kind of settling in in a regular PPR league? Yeah, unless there are major changes, he probably still goes as the first tight end off the board, but I think people are going to be scared. He's going to go in the second or third round. And we saw the same things happen with Gronk and with Jimmy Graham too, where like, you know, people were drafting them when they were at their peak and having these peak seasons, like 18 touchdowns for Gronk. Obviously, he's going to go in the first round. But the thing is, he could easily return value. To be completely honest with you, Theo, this might sound crazy. I've never had, in, in a league where I set a lineup, I've never had Travis Kelsey. Not one time, not one time. I've never traded for him in Dynasty. I've never, you know, I, I've never had him in, in redraft just because it's not the way that I play. And it's not been a problem for me. Uh, but I do get you get an advantage with a guy like that. And I think next year might be the first time I do draft him. If he falls to like the third round, I will start drafting. Yeah, I've, I've, I've even had plans to draft him in like the Scott Fish Bowl and FFPC. Like I wanted him, but in those tight end premium leagues, he goes like fifth overall. So I just never got him. So I don't know. Maybe it'll be my first time for me. Well, Billy Muzio and I each drew the 101 in the Scott Fishbowl this year, and we both didn't do very well uh, compared to what we've done in years past uh, with Kelsey at the top spot. So for whatever it's worth, he's way he was way less of an edge this year than he was last year. This year you had to take him higher, and last year he he outscored what he's doing this year. So and also last year you had way less tight ends sort of smashing. There were less guys coming out of nowhere, not out of nowhere, but guys that were like impactful guys you drafted in like the mid and later rounds. So I do think that's an interesting one. Uh, Let's talk about quickly, not on the show sheet, Trey McBride. Trey McBride. First off, where do you have Trey McBride in this week's rankings coming off of a bye week? I'm going to guess. I'm going to guess four. Yeah. So I I think I actually have him five. Just I don't love the matchup with the 49ers. And the thing that that stinks is we didn't really uh, typically we'd know we'd have a, a sample size because he's already had, would have played the team when he did play them. There was no Kyler Murray and Zach Ertz was still around. So he only had one catch. I mean, he had one catch and one tackle in the game because uh, you know, he made a tackle on an interception. So Trey McBride is a guy where I, we know he's going to be involved, but there's enough guys that are definitively involved that have better matchups. And I think I have him five, but like you're starting Trey McBride, if you have him, unless you obviously have a bunch of stars, which, you know, this year, 
it's the case for a lot of people because you had all these guys coming from outside the top 10, 12 to now be studs. So, but Trey McBride, what we want to see for him in Dynasty, I will add, is that that's the, the next step is does the team build around him? Do they make him a focal point? Like it was clear with Travis Kelsey and Mark Andrews and Darren Waller and going back through time, Rob Gronkowski and Jimmy Graham, that they were going to be a top two target on the team, that they were focal points of the team, right? And you kind of saw, you know, uh, with some of these teams, they go out and they do go, they added a Jordan Addison. Look at the Eagles. The Eagles had an opportunity to, to plant their flag and say Dallas Goddard is the guy. We're going to lean on this guy. And instead they go out and they trade for A.J. Brown, they get Devonta Smith, and he kind of settled in. So yeah. that's with McBride, that's the big test that's coming up because we like the talent. We just want to make sure that they don't go out and go crazy at wide receiver. And now it's it's thin, right? So that's what we're rooting for. But at least we know that this guy is a good player. We just we've seen plenty of good players fall into bad quarterback play in competition. Case number one, Pat Frymu, right? Like no one, there's nobody out there that says Pat Frymu stinks, right? I haven't heard anybody say it. But the situation's not good, so that's the only concern for McBride. But gotta love, gotta love the price you paid to get him in redraft and dynasty. Yeah, he's easily the best waiver wire addition uh, of the year. And you know, some people are like, "Yo, not in my league, bro." We drafted Trey McBride, but you know, I was able to add Trey McBride in FFPC leagues, NFFC leagues. So you know, Those he people, was a man. waiver wire. Yeah, yeah. There's there's the people that I, I listen. I'm I'm definitely I've definitely uh, dropped a not in my league, bro, on some people. But when it comes to Trey McBride, yes. He was a waiver wire tight end, but in the in the grand scheme of things, let's say they add one wide receiver, let's say they add one alpha. Where does Tim, Trey McBride end up next year in redraft? Because I think in dynasty, like he's locked in, but I think next year, are we talking about a guy who the market is going to value and he's going to end up like a top five tight end next year, or do you think he's one of these guys that kind of becomes a value um, just because of the strength of the position? Yeah, I mean, no matter what, he's going to be at value. I think they would have to go out and add like two stars and move Marquise Brown to like the slot for it to ever be a problem. So I think he's going to be easily top 10. It's just every year, and th this is the problem we run into with trying to do this in advance, is every year we have to sit down and, and look and say, okay, does this guy have a shot to be a focal point? Can it be a top two target on the team? Because historically speaking, that's one of the biggest and best indicators that we, we see, right? So first we look and say, okay, Kelsey's probably going to maintain that spot. Does this Ravens team, do they move in the direction of adding more wide receivers with the, with the Todd Munkin offense? Like uh, does Darren Waller end up being a focal point? Like, so I think Trey McBride where he ends up depends on what some of these other teams do, obviously first and foremost. But I mean, I got to say, I'm feeling good about it. Same with a guy like Sam Laporta. I mean, like Sam Laporta and Amon Ross St. Brown, who are they going to bring in? That's going to slot in ahead of Sam Laporta or, and why do they even need to do that? Right? Do you need to La even need to do that? So Laporta's the people are, are going to be climbing over themselves to draft Sam Laporta heading into year two. I think when you take a like a bird's eye view of the season, a lot of times I think we react so quickly to what the guy did from the previous week, and somebody might be like a little disappointed in like the usage from a week. But then we take a bird's eye view and we look at counting stats in the postseason, and it's going to be like, oh my god, Sam Laporta is so good. Right. I'm drafting him as tight end one in redraft. But I want to just get a gauge on this because. We're not. We're talking redraft today. I don't want to get too dynasty-ish, but we have one of the best tight end prospects of all time in Brock Bowers coming up in in this draft. And I know there's some other guys people are excited about, like Jatavian Sanders, but Brock Bowers seems like the enthusiasm for him might be higher than it was for Kyle Pitts, and certainly it's higher than it was for Kyle Pitts like this early in like the the evaluative process. What are your what's that kind of your feel with with Bowers? Not even like your evaluation of him, but am I wrong on this? Is this going to be like a a unicorn type tight end that is going to kind of break the mold in terms of the enthusiasm fantasy managers have for him at such a young age? Yeah, and I'll tell you the easy uh, this is an easy one for me because I, I wrote an article called if you type in Andrew Cooper Dynasty. Dynasty tight end concepts. This one comes right up. And I talked about why it's not just for dynasty. It's also for redraft. I talk about why it's so difficult for tight ends to break out early on. And it's, it's because you need to be the best pass catching tight end in the room. First and foremost, which isn't that easy. Goddard was stuck behind the earths. Delaney Walker was stuck behind Vernon Davis until he was 30 years old. Right. And then after that, you need to be a top two target. Like we talk about, and it happens so rarely, right? Evan Ingram needed Odell Beckham jr. To tear his knee up. 
right? Uh, Kyle Pitts obviously was drafted into that position. And that's the thing about Brock Bowers and how good he is and what kind of a skill set he has. And it's why we like Laporte and why we like Kincaid is they were drafted to come in and immediately be the Travis Kelsey role, which is that you are a premier slot player that can split out wide and you're running real routes up and down the seam. And that's what Brock Bowers is. Any team that goes out and drafts this guy, he's going to be a top target on the team with the exception of a couple teams. Right, the number one scary one. I'm sure you don't even say it. I know what you're. I'm going to read your mind. Don't even say that he stays in state because you're going to get people throwing up while they listen to this podcast. Right. Yeah. So I mean, that's the thing, dude. If he were to go to the, I mean, the Falcons would be a terrible spot. It truly would. The other ones, the other one, there, there are other really bad ones too. What if Todd Munkin, who coached him in college, wants him, and then now he ends up as a coming up like Isaiah likely kind of as a part-time guy. The other one that I that is very realistic that I don't like that people are going to like and I'm not going to like for the short term for redraft is the Miami Dolphins. Yeah. Because you know he's going to have a good floor there, but the ceiling is going to be capped by the presence of Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddle. And that's the we see it with George Kittle where it's like with 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 Debo and Ayuk and CMC He's still a great player, but every once in a while, they don't need to lean on him. I mean, Shanahan said it himself. He's a great blocker, and sometimes they want to have him block instead of Christian McCaffrey. Sometimes they want to throw it to Ayuk, and to, you know, a bunch of those games, he only has three targets. A couple of those games, he has one catch. So that's the concern, right? But just look around. Like Uncle Ted in the chat, love that one. Uh, Chargers could use a tight end. Bad, man. That would be great. Tampa, I do like Kate Otten, but in Tampa with Mike Evans gone, like I mean, he could be playing full. He could be playing split end on a on a ton of snaps in a spot like that, right? Like we're looking around. The best spots for him to go are are teams that have one wide receiver and are just going to use him at wide receiver, right? The maybe, you know, uh, the Rams as Cooper Cup ages. There's there's a bunch of. I mean, like the. It's hard because I hate erasing all the tight ends that are already incumbents in a spot. But just think of all these guys where if he showed up, he'd just immediately be better. He, he's right? going to dust. He's going to dust pretty much anybody around. Whoever him. it is, yeah. Um, we're we're going to dive into a bunch of these fantasy risers. A couple guys we got to get into our starting lineups this week. We're also going to touch on a couple of tight ends, and we got to talk about how Miami would look if Tyree Kill is going to miss time uh, after we take a quick break. Hey, we're all starting new fantasy leagues all the time. And more often than not, where do we start our fantasy leagues at Player Profiler? On Sleeper. Because it's the best. You can imagine my excitement when I saw Sleeper rolled out. Sleeper picks, baby. And game stacking is the path to positive returns with these pick'em games. Find that sneaky shootout set most of the players to go over their projection for that week. Or you find a game going to get dragged into the mud and take every member of the passing game for less than their projections that week. And if you pick up to eight, that's how you 100x your payout on Sleeper. It's called the Hail Mary. So if you use promo code UNDERWORLD, you get a $100 instant deposit match. Check out Sleeper's terms and conditions for details. These Sleeper picks are live in over 25 states. Yeah, buddy. Welcome back to Press Coverage. Theo Greminger here with Andrew Cooper. It's one of the more like ridiculous accomplishments we've ever seen is Raheem Mostert's season where he's now at 18 touchdowns, like the most random smash season we've ever seen from a running back in fantasy football. Andrew, I think you're on mute. Sorry, I was distracted there. What was the question? My baby, baby's crying. In the oh no, no worries. New, no new worries. dad stuff going on over here. Listen, listen. I, I, I know not you my know first rodeo when it comes to that. I got, I got three myself. But yeah. Raheem Mostert, his his season is this the most random like smash season we've ever seen? I see somebody saying Legarrette Blunt in the chat. Like, yeah. I think it's way ahead of Legarrette Blunt uh, at this point. I mean, Legarrette Blunt, his, his season is more comparable to. Uh, Jamal Williams, where it was like they had just happened to have a very non-mobile quarterback in a very prolific offense, so 18 touchdowns, right? Like somebody's got to punch it in. Whereas in this case, this offense is built this way, and the the reason that people were off it, I mean, I was drafting a bunch of best ball because you know I thought, hey, you know what? Why not with this group? Why 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 not go with the familiar face? But the reason people were off him is like, how often do you see a 30 year old back? Have like a, a breakout season, and say hello, Felix. Very often, right? But if you 
look at how the offense is built exactly the same way the 49ers have it. For the 49ers, in my opinion, you have the best offensive lineman in football in Trent Williams, and they have the best fullback, Cal check very easy. So the same team, they paid for the but the most expensive free agent available that year in Toronto instead be their credibility as a left tackle. And then they allocate to their Kyle Yushek. And as long as you're a patient back that waits and finds the holes and has the explosiveness, then it's, it's actually not that crazy at all. You probably should have seen it coming from a mile away. It's just, you know, we got to find by the Devon HN and, and the Jeff Wilson goal line and stuff. And you forgot that this guy quietly has like three of the fastest plays on a few times in the last like five years. Like Raheem Mostert is just a good player. You know, it's crazy because it's one of those tilting teammate arbitrage decisions where every year you think it's the guy at the top, like a Debo versus a Brandon Ayuk that kind of tilts your season, a Jim Waddle versus Tyree Kill, a Devonta Smith versus an A.J. Brown. But it turned out to be the Jeff Wilson versus Raheem Mostert decision that sort of like made your best ball team or your redraft team. Uh, it, it's it's wild times, especially when we had that period of time where Devon A. Chain went down in the preseason and there was like fear and you're drafting a Dol- Dolphins running back every single draft. Uh, very, very tilting times. Want to pivot back over to the tight end position yeah. is David and Let's Joku. Go. Tight listen, ends, I got, Listen, I got to read the room. I got Coop in the house. We're talking tight ends. Is David and Joku the 2023 version of 2022 Evan Ingram and 2019 Tyler Higby. Is this your ad, kind of, I'm not going to call him out of nowhere, but the guy who's taking his game to uh, the next level at the right period of time in sort of a perfect storm with Joe Flacco coming off the couch and making Njoku look like a mustard everywhere, no matter who you have. Right. Uh, absolutely right now, honestly. And the thing is, it's funny that, we all have these feelings, like gut feelings when it comes to certain players. And we sit back and we say, oh, that guy, he he's very safe. He makes me feel safe. Like Dallas Goddard at tight end has always been the example where it's like, you know, he doesn't really get end zone targets. But people say, oh, you know what? He's pretty safe. And the reason most times that people don't know why they have that feeling, I got one word, screens. It's those manufactured touches. And you go back and you look at Engram last year. And he was top three in the league in screens. In fact, Higby was also top three in screens. Dallas Goddard was number one, right? This year, Evan Engram is number one. Dave and Joku's two. Engram has 20 screens. And Joku has 17. Goddard's next closest, 11 and 10 games. Trey McBride's up there too, right? These are all in PPR. These are automatic. And in a world where the tight ends are getting, you know, even the good ones are getting like 50, 60, 70 yards. Those receptions are humongous, man. And and Tyler Higby, the year you're talking about 2019, also top three in screens. I remember distinctly because I was like, how is this happening? And it just turned out that that stretch at the end of the season with Jared Goff, screens, 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 right? Like just nonstop, especially in the Cowboys game. So that's what it is with these guys where David Njoku, Evan Engram, incredibly safe because no matter what the matchup is, you can't really stop that. You know what I mean? Unless you're uh, – who was it that picked off the screen uh, this past week? That was an amazing play, dude. That well, I was – that was – came out of nowhere to snag that screen in the backfield. But, like, for the most part, screens are automatic. What, what, a question in the chat. Where do you get your screen data, Andrew? Oh, so I, I get that. That one's Pro Football Focus. I should have shouted them out. So those numbers are from Pro Football Focus. You go over to Concept. Right. So there's a receiving concept tab and then it's set to slot. There's a drop down and you can change it from slot to screens and you can check out how many screens there are there. It's it's not always 100 percent accurate like any other space. They do have to make judgment calls. You know what I mean, Theo? Like, yeah, yeah. there are some very obvious screens and there are some like kind of like bubble screens that, you know, they look more like slants. So they're doing their best. But I'll tell you like that. Those are the numbers. And if you go and look at a guy like Evan Ingram and you wonder why his yak is so low. Sorry, his yak is high, but his A dot's low. It's the screens, and I'm fine with it. I'll take it. We'll take whatever we can get. What about Evan Ingram? I said, you know, the 2022 Evan Ingram. Evan Ingram is officially snatching souls once again. Right. How high are we pushing Evan Ingram this week? He looks like – I know Zay Jones gets the 14 targets, but it's been Evan Ingram time. Uh, you know, all season long, he's he's been a consistent producer, but now we get Christian Kirk done for the season – Evan Ingram, he's a must start. And how how high is his ceiling weekly now for the next four weeks, three weeks? 
Yeah, I mean, I was worried about Ingram for these two weeks because Brown's tough matchup. Uh, they actually just lost Grant Delpit, so maybe not that tough anymore. Uh, but the Ravens also tough matchup. But you look at you know what they're doing with him now. It's basically that like Parker Washington didn't didn't get the full Christian Kirk role. Like Evan Ingram's playing a ton. He was already playing a ton of slot, but now he's just a full time slot wide receiver man. So like it's wheels up for him moving forward. I. I, I, if he can go off like that against the Browns, I have a hard time ranking him lower than five or six or seven. So yeah, Anthony's right. Yeah, if he can go off against the the Browns, were the number one defense against the tight end. It wasn't even close. Coming into this week, Theo, the Browns in DraftKings points were letting up five point nine points per week. That's the lowest we've seen in seventeen years. Two thousand six awesome. Patriots were the last time there was that low. Everett Ingram goes out and scores two touchdowns. Again, it could maybe it's Grant Delpit, but I don't see any other defense that's going to cause a problem, even, even the, the Ravens. So, like, it's going to be very difficult not to start Evan Ingram unless you also have Laporta, which not many people have that combo because they have the same bye week, right? And the, Or you also have Hawkinson, but, like, you know, like people weren't drafting Ingram and Hawkinson or Ingram and Kelsey. If if you did do that, then congratulations, you're rich, you know? But like, I, I, got, I got a Laporta-Ingram team. Yeah, yeah. Because you, you don't, don't care about bye weeks because you're smart. Because you're smart, I, and you don't. You I get through one week. I'll get through one week, and I'll be all right. Yeah. Um, what about Isaiah Likely? Are we there with Isaiah Likely? You had the six target game heading into the bye week. Now post bye week, he has another pretty strong, uh, strong, strong scoreline. The touchdown he sort of got away from the defense. It was one of those kind of catch and runs. It's the um, Ram. It's the Ram. So like that's what that's that's where matchups really elevate those things though, because that's not a touchdown against every team. That's a touchdown yeah. against the Bengals. It's a touchdown against the Rams. It's a touchdown against the Broncos. Right. So like, but we'll take it. You know. So Isaiah, likely for you, what's your your comfort level with him? What's your confidence level with him in the fantasy playoffs here? Because I do feel like a lot of managers have start sit decisions with Isaiah. Likely, he was a guy you picked up on waivers. And some people would just pick him up on waivers just because he was one of the better options that week. It wasn't necessarily to fill a positional need. So I'll give you a start sit. Isaiah Likely or Kyle Pitts this week? Isaiah Likely. I'll tell you this. You can give, give me start sits for pretty much everybody except for like four guys. I have Isaiah Likely, Isaiah Likely ahead of Trey McBride because I don't want to oh, wow. start. I don't want to start him against the 49ers if I can start Isaiah Likely this week. And I'll tell you what, uh, you know, Isaiah Likely going up against the Jaguars. David yeah. Joku just had two touchdowns against David Joku just scored a touchdown where there wasn't a Jaguar on the screen this past week. You know what I mean? And then he scored another one. So here's the thing with Isaiah Likely. I'm, I'm in on Isaiah Likely now. I was in on him the week that Mark Andrews got hurt and he had two targets in the box score. I was in on Isaiah Likely in July, in June. You can quote me on this. You can pull it up. I said, if Mark Andrews goes down, I'm going to be confident starting this guy. And I'll tell you what, this is we, why you well, got I'll, I'll pause this out. I got receipts on this one because, Coop, you discussed Isaiah Likely with Billy Muzio and I on first class fantasy as like one of the best contingent upside you. plays you could get at the position. And yes, this past summer you were all over him. So I, hat tip. I said there was one, I said there was one handcuff. And I also wrote an article saying this is, this is a difference between Mark Andrews and Dallas Goddard. If Dallas Goddard goes down, then you're, you got nothing. If Mark Andrews goes down, then you drop your fab on Isaiah likely and you're back up and running. Right. And this is why you got to watch the football games is because that first game where Mark Andrews got hurt, you go back and watch that game, and Isaiah Likely is all over the place. The box score showed zero catches on two targets. But if you watch that game, what you did have is you had a 30-yard pass to him that got tipped, and Nelson Aguilar caught it and took it to the end zone. So that doesn't go in the books as a target. You have a, a pass to him where he checked over his shoulder for a defender, kind of a young guy mistake, and dropped it. That was a mistake on him, but that should have been a catch in any other situation. Most times it's a catch. You had this, So he dropped that one. Two plays later, they called the same exact play, and he caught it. Then it was holding on a lot on uh, on one of the linemen, so that doesn't count as a target. Later, wide open on a scramble, and Lamar doesn't throw it to him. No target there, and then ends the game with a bad throw. This guy should have easily had. He had four actual looks: one tipped, one you know that gets called back in a penalty, another one, and then he had a fifth one that should have gave to him. So I looked at it and I said, this guy was clearly involved. It just didn't pan out right. Next two weeks, what does he get? Targets, 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 touchdowns. So Isaiah Likely, man, in this role, in this offense with Lamar Jackson, with all the injuries to tight ends and all the injuries to quarterbacks, I don't, and all the bad matchups for guys like, you know, we don't like 
playing Baltimore. We don't like playing the Browns. We don't like playing the Titans. We don't like playing the 49ers. With all the bad matchups, all those things, I just can't see how people are sitting there with Isaiah Likely and saying, oh, I don't know. I know. I'm starting. Forget it. And, and I'll give a shout out to the chat because we have a very educated uh, fan, fan, we're not, you know, listening base Stars. at press coverage. Yeah. Uh, and somebody in the chat is asking about Darren Waller. I had him on the show sheet. If Darren Waller returns, is he a must start for you? Uh, you know, and taking a kind of a step back, looking at the the Giants offense, like Wondell Robinson had a big game post bye week. Uh, you have Saquon Barkley every single week. But other than that, it's sort of screaming for a guy like Darren Waller. Yeah, here's dude, here's best case scenario. Darren Waller somehow returns this week and you start somebody else and you see what he looks like. Because if he plays, give me 60% of the snaps. If he plays like even that much, his schedule, his last two weeks couldn't be better, dude. Like two bottom five teams versus the tight end in the Eagles and the Rams. Like I just said with the Rams, like the Rams – the very worst two teams are the Bengals and the uh, and the Broncos, right? They're in a tier of their own, a land of their own, letting up just absurd points. I mean, the Bengals lost both their safeties in free agency and Vaughn Bell and Jesse Bates. What do we expect, you know? But the Rams are kind of in, in their own tier as third. Like, they're the, that team is easy. And the, the Eagles all year, that's how people have made their money over the middle on them. So if Waller's back, I would love to see him back this week. But honestly, if he's a full go for those games, it's going to be tough deciding. And, and people should stash that guy wherever they can. Here's one a little bit lower on the tight end uh, po totem pole, but two guys who had very effective games last week. Hunter Henry gets two touchdowns in the random Bailey Zappi game, uh, and then you have Davis Allen, who kind of came out of nowhere, catches a touchdown, ends up with like four catches. Uh, both of these guys made my waiver wire column um, because there wasn't a whole lot of tight ends to, to discuss this week. Where are you at on Henry versus Allen? Which one would you be more comfortable using this week? Yeah, so there's tight end is a position where at the top, like you don't care whether it's standard or half PPR or or full PPR for some of these guys, right? Travis Kelsey, it doesn't matter, right? Sam Laporta doesn't matter. Some of these guys, it does matter. George Kittle is much more valuable in standard than he is in full PPR. There's no question. And Hunter Henry is one of the players. Besides maybe Taysom Hill. Taysom Hill is the one that moves the farthest in my rankings from standard to to PPR. And you know my you know my stance on Taysom. But the person that moves the farthest from my rankings in PPR to to uh standard that actually plays tight end is Hunter Henry. Because he he is so good versus man to man, right? And he creates so well in those situations that he does have a red zone advantage. And the numbers show that his success rate versus man to man in lockdown situations. That's why he scores you know, last week, two touchdowns, but he did it only three targets. It's not a prolific offense, right? So for me, Hunter Henry, whether or not I can use him depends entirely on whether Pop Douglas is playing, whether Devontae Parker's playing, because when those guys are all out, then they will use Hunter Henry for the whole game. When those guys are playing, he's just another part of the rotation, and he doesn't play the full game, he plays like 60 70%. Sometimes sometimes he has lower than a 50% route participation, and you're just, just chasing touchdowns. The, you know, when I look around my portfolio of what I do with Dynasty, Redraft, Best Ball, uh, Betting, DFS, the two things I like Hunter Henry best for are Best Ball and for anytime touchdown bets. It's just, it's hard to trust them. But the anytime touchdown, uh, as as Toronto Dave says, betting on the Hunter to get in the hen, the hen house there, I, that's a bet I'm willing to take a lot. So Hunter Henry over Davis Allen if you're looking on the waiver wire still and you need a dart throw. Yeah, the problem with Davis Allen is, and this is where got a shout out to our friends over at Player Profiler because it's that's this is my go to. I have you know Fantasy Alarm is obviously my site and a lot of the stats I know exactly where to get over there. But I use you guys all the time for when I I we have an unknown commodity and I say who what's the deal with this guy? He's a tight end, so I already looked at it before, but. Uh, you want to see with tight ends, you want to see the key thing, the difference maker for a lot of these guys is speed, right? And that's where this guy lacks. He did four, eight, four means he needs to be peppered with targets. He's six, six. So he has a, a end zone threat, but these guys, that's the difference between George Kittle. He runs a four, five, two. So he can at any time break off a 70 yard touchdown. And we've seen him do it Four eight four. This guy ain't breaking off any, what, what, do, what do you think that is? Like 20th percentile over on, on player profiler. It's not fast coop. It's no, not it's fast not at all. Fast, it's so, not. It's not the sort of explosion we want in our lineups right. uh, this time of year. 
Um, want to pivot over uh, to some non tight end questions. Right. Ezekiel Elliott goes nuts. This was like ridiculous. He absorbed all of the targets for Ramondre Stevenson and then some. Wide receivers were missing for New England. And I think Zeke had like 10 PPR points on the first drive. This was like a, a ridiculous game from him. I find myself making start sit decisions with Zeke this week. Like you'd have Zeke on some benches thinking it was like a depth piece. Now I'm like putting him in over like Tony Pollard this week. Am I overrating the situation or are we going to see another ridiculous volume game for, for Zeke this week? He had 22 carries and I believe he had eight catches uh, against Pittsburgh. It's wild. Tony Pollard might be taking it to the limit a little bit. That might be taking, but, but I feel you in that it, it really depends on your own risk tolerance and the way you play this game. Like I know there are some people out there that just, ref- they will rank every single guy getting the full workload over anyone splitting, right? Which I personally don't do that. I am willing to put uh, Raheem Mostert and Devon Achan and, and Jameer Gibbs and David Montgomery ahead of some of these full guys getting every single touch. But like when I look around at guys like like Rashad White now, people people were off him, but there's something to be said for getting every touch, and now he's he's popping off, right? James Conner manages to get it done on a terrible team. I, I can't see a world where you're ranking James Conner in one spot, but you're not ranking Zeke at least at, at that high, if not much higher. Zach Moss as well. Like teams where – the running is fine. You know, the team is probably going to lose the game, but he's getting all the touches. Like you, you, you get through a certain range where I have the high end guys and then I have the guys that are splitting that I trust. And then Zeke has to be in the next group. He has to be in there and he has to be ahead of a lot of these guys that are, if, if any sort of three headed monster, Zeke goes ahead. So I have him ahead of every Raven. I have him ahead of every bear. I have him ahead, right. Like, uh, and then a lot of the two teams, I have him ahead of both Browns backs. Like, Oh, I haven't had a both Seahawks back, right? Like once you start going through it and breaking it down that way, you, like I can't see how people are ranking Zeke outside of the top 20, right? It's not even realistic. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm completely with you. I think he's almost a must start unless you have great, great choices this week. Exactly. Uh, another guy, one guy who's giving people a little bit of pause. You bring up the high value touch guys, um, Keaton Mitchell. I have yeah. Keaton Mitchell as a guy I want to get in my lineup this week. But again, it's a guy who's, I know the volume's not going to be there. I'm almost betting on him to house it um, or just be extremely efficient with like receptions. How many receptions, man? How many touches are we talking here? uh, Like in a projection for, for Mitchell, it's difficult to, to gauge it because yeah, the, the, the targets are there, but I don't know if I can accurately predict how many carries he's going to end up with. Well, the the problem the problem with this team, and it's why I kind of steer away is that if he, if it was a two back split, if it was Gus Edwards as a starter and he was the pass down back, then I'd be all over it because that's how we've been playing the Jags all year. Jags are a top five team in DVOA against the run, but they're allowing the most receptions to running backs by like they're allowing like seven a game, literally the most. And this trend goes all the way back to last year. Last year they were allowing the second most to running backs. And it's not just Kamara having 14 receptions. We watched Joe Mixon do it the other day. First play of the game was 28 yards. I think he ended up with seven receptions, right? So that's how Keaton Mitchell is going to make his money in this game. And it's what scares me about Gus Edwards is that Gus is now, I mean, this is like a touchdown or nothing Gus game, right? And, uh, you know, I mean, Justice Hill, we don't trust. No. If Justice Hill wasn't in the picture at all, I would rank Keaton Mitchell against the Jaguars a lot higher, right? Because I know he can catch the ball and I know he can break off big plays. And that's how you beat the Jags is that you, you let him overcommit you know, Josh Allen, you let him overcommit on the pass rush and then you hit him with a screen or a running back pass. That's what teams have been doing. And they kind of – it's built into the way they play to allow for that. I just – I wish there was no Justice Hill because he's just just annoying enough, man. I – you know? I yeah. Know. You see, it's – it's. don't even get me started on Justice Hill. He's bothering uh, me, dude. Yeah. Let's stay, stay in Baltimore here. Odell Beckham, big game last week. How confident are you putting Odell Beckham into your lineup – against this beat up Jack. Well, not necessarily beat up, but very generous Jacksonville secondary. I know this is where we should be doing it. Right. Uh, but just, this is the exact player, man, that, that, you know, right. Yeah. Like he just, he, he's got every, every, every red flag possible, right. Like he could go off. I could see him having a hundred yards and two touchdowns, 150 and two touchdowns. Right. But Perman says it, he's a part-time yeah. player. 
He's an attitude issue guy. And he somebody pulled up a quote where he said football's not even fun anymore. And he's an injury prone guy. He's an older guy. It's like everything about o- OBJ says that he's either going to win me my matchup or lose me my matchup. And I just would rather not start those guys if I can avoid it because, you know, as much as we say that we avoid that, that we don't try and predict who's going to get hurt and who's not or who's going to slow down or who doesn't, it's usually the older guys. Like, where's Michael Thomas? Where's Adam Thielen now? You know, so I, I, he scares me, man. In DFS, well, in DFS, I like him, but you know, I don't know. I'll say this: if I am a sizable underdog, let's say I'm a six seed and I'm a big dog to like a three seed in my playoffs, and I'm looking at starting like a like a floor play guy or OBJ yeah. in a December game against that secondary, I'm OBJ rolling the dice, scoop. I'm, I'm with you, bro. Dice. I'm with you. I know. I'm, I'm 100%. You can take, and I, again, you can take all the Tyler Boyds in the world. You can take even my guy, Josh Downs. That's, you know, if, if I'm going to play guys that are playing a partial snap share, it's going to be the, it's going to be the Odell's, dude. The guys that can escape, right? Because he can escape for a big one at any given time. So I, all of these guys that are playing, like, you know, most teams have two guys that play every snap. Some, some teams have one, some teams have none which is so, you know, like the Chiefs up until now had nobody playing every snap, right? But like, so of the part-time guys, I have them up there. It's just, it's hard for me. Some of these games, he's playing like 13 snaps. The like, I'm yeah. just like, what the heck? We're yeah, like no, 10, it's 10 rounds. No, for sure. What are your confidence level on Rasheed Rice heading into the playoffs now? Rasheed Rice seems to have yeah. taken a big step forward in terms of his usage. Got to be excited about Rasheed Rice in the fantasy playoffs. Love Rasheed Rice, man. Love. Her. I had a ticket, a Rasheed Rice uh, Rookie of the Year ticket at plus eight thousand that I threw in there, dude. I was like, whatever. So you know, CJ Stroud obviously ruined that, but you know, I, I do. I did like the player a lot, and and to put it so, I do the snap count over articles for our fantasy line members. This one's paywalled, and what I do for this article, I I don't know why we call it the snap count article. It should really be called Coop's thoughts on every single fantasy relevant player. Because that's what it is. I go through and I say, here's what I'm thinking. But like when I do this, I go through and look at the snaps for every single team every single week. And to put in perspective, when I say that some teams have no to, wide receiver playing the whole game, this team has two two games where a wide receiver played more than 70% of the snaps. 70. 70 is not that much, Theo. Like Michael Pittman, go over to player profiler and tell me what what percentage of the snaps Michael Pittman's played this year. Is it 97? Mike, Michael Pittman's like 90, 90, 90 plus every single week. No doubt. He, he might literally be at 97 on the season, not week to week yeah. on the season. On this team, only two games a, a wide receivers played more than 70% of the snaps. It was week two, Marquez Valdez Scanling played 82% of the snaps. The other one, this past week, Rashi Rice. 85% of the snaps. So I don't know, man. I'm taking it and I'm running with it, baby. Rashi Rice wills up. Let's go. Rashi Rice is going to be like that player that has such good fantasy playoffs that he's going to move up so much in 2024 redraft. Um, it's going to be scary where he's going to be up. out. We're going to be Coop. out. We're so in on him now that we're going to end up out on him, right? Coop, we're going to end up Coop. selling him. We're, we're, we're almost here at 430, and I don't want to keep you too long. I go. I, I, I changed my mind. Once once the show starts, I'm like, nah, let's just talk ball. Okay, you know, so let's... I'm gonna I'm gonna rip I'm gonna rip through a couple more guys. Drake okay. London, confidence level on Drake London just had an absolute smash game. Did not find the end zone, but went wild. Are we fully back? Is it the same as last year, where Drake London's gonna save the best for last and be really strong to end the season? Theo, you know I'm a friend first and foremost, and I know you're a Drake London guy. So the answer is yes. There we go. There we go. Coop <laughs> says, start your Drake London. Let's go Chuba Hubbard. Chuba Hubbard yeah. plays for the one of the worst uh, offenses in the league, but the volume is wild lately. Do you trust Chuba Hubbard in like an RB2 or a flex spot based on, I know he's going to get a ton of touches, but I don't think his offense is going to score too many points. How do you gauge touches versus offensive futility with a player like Hubbard who's got a little bit of juice? Yeah, no question, man. I will say this is where I got to apologize to people. Like, you know, we we do we do our best, right? And we shouldn't have to apologize because, like, you know, we we put all the work in and we explain why we're doing things. But I will say, I was very much in on Miles Sanders. Wrote a full time out, Coop. I'm not going to let you apologize for Miles Sanders because okay. you told everybody to take Sam Laporta, and then last year you told everybody to take Evan Engram. Mm-hmm. Like you don't need to apologize. Wait, like okay, okay. we don't need, we're not doing, we, you could relitigate this on, on your own podcast. If, and time out, if anybody like, I'll, I'll set the record straight. 
no, if a, if a fantasy analyst miss on somebody who's in being drafted in like the sixth round, no one's draft is ruined by drafting a sixth round running back, a fifth round running back. Your draft is not ruined by a fifth rounder or sixth rounder. Now, if somebody's pounding the table and telling you to take somebody in the top five and that player has a terrible season, you can hold that, uh, that uh, analyst accountable, but you're not allowed to hold people's feet to the fire for, for like a sixth rounder. I drafted Miles Sanders in like the eighth round of an FFPC draft one time this summer. Right, like yeah. it happens, man. It happens. It's a dead zone. You hit that dead zone. You flew yeah. too close to the sun, Scoop. If I was telling people to draft him in like the first round or second round, I guess. Yeah. All right. So yeah. Well, anyway, if anyone took Miles Sanders on my advice, I, you know, I, you just have to eat it because I'm eating a bunch of Miles Sanders too. But I will tell you this. Chuba Hubbard, man, since they, they fired the coaches, I mean, they're just leaning on this guy. 20 touches in back-to-back weeks since Deuce daly has been gone, man. It sounds like Deuce daly was the only person speaking up for Miles Sanders. So if that's what they're going to do, how are we going to argue with that, dude? Like, And, and this is – you know, this this matchup they have this week is no different than the ones they've had the last two weeks for rushing. So I don't see why Chuba Hubbard wouldn't also – would you just continue to get crazy volume, right? So, yeah, I'm in on Chuba. And I know I, I bashed Justice Hill earlier, so and that's one of uh, Linda's favorite uh, favorite players, our uh, our friend at Lindellians. Maybe not favorite, but she's been a truther. She loves Chuba Hubbard. He went to Ohio State, so I feel Oklahoma, like Oklahoma, had... Oklahoma State, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State. State, yeah, Oklahoma yep. State. So I, I'm now broken even. I've broken even now for for our good friend Linda. I'm there you go. Shout out, shout out to Linda. Uh, an awesome follow on Twitter. Um, want to want to talk about Russell Wilson because Russell Wilson has 23 touchdown passes, only eight interceptions. Uh, Cortland Sutton has 10 touchdown catches. We got to feel pretty good about Denver. They have a primetime game against Detroit this coming Saturday evening. Um, and then the rest of the playoff schedule is fantasy friendly. I think that they have New England a week later. Where are we at on Russell Wilson, your confidence level for him? I mean, the thing is, from a real life standpoint, Russell Wilson's been great. Like, he's won a bunch of the, like, the problem that we, for there was a stretch there where the problem was actually that he was too good at running the offense and protecting the football, like where they, they were just winning these games too easily. Like that stretch there where he, where he didn't have a single pick for like, well, like six games and they won all six. Like I was looking at that and wondering what the heck was happening. He, like the, one of the games he uh, looking at his game log, he threw for a hundred threw for three touchdowns only for 114 yards though. So like, I don't think he's going to knock anybody's socks off. And I'm a, I guess I'd be a little worried against about the Patriots matchup if I was going to be worried about any, but with all these injuries, man, I mean, it's kind of hard you know, with Justin Herbert now done and, you know, Vikings switching over quarterbacks, like it's kind of hard not to rank the guys in QB1 range, right? Yeah, that's kind of my thing with Russell Wilson is he also could have had two more touchdown passes last week if Jerry Judy would have just been normal. Right. Um, drag a foot, man. Drag a foot, Jerry Judy. Hash- Shout out to Jerry Judy. We, we're not like, you know, trying to be too critical on you here, but drag a foot. I mean, this is, this is, that's like a, a tilting, tilting play. Huge, uh, that right. cost people a ton of money. So that's that's one you want to see. Uh, how about James Cook? Huge game tonight. Like Buffalo, it's like the weirdest thing. It seems like every week Buffalo's in some massive nationally televised game now. They they beat Kansas City last week. This week, they get to play the Dallas Cowboys. James Cook, to me, looking like a top eight play, top 10 play at, at running back this week. It should be a very high scoring game. How confident are you on James Cook? I mean, just look at his receiving the last couple of weeks, dude. Like killing, right? What do you have? Six caught six of seven for fifty-seven. Then he then he had caught like another. Well, he caught no, he caught six of seven, and then the week before they caught five. Like his receiving stats look like Tyler Boyd stats. James Cook right now is Tyler Boyd. If Tyler Boyd also got ten to fifteen carries, like James Cook doesn't get much better than that. And Latavius Murray was the big concern. Now he's on the back burner. And Leonard Fournette never showed up. So, like, yeah, what's that? Why did they even know. sign Leonard Fournette? What a weird distraction signing. And they, they, they signed Leonard Fournette only to have Ty Johnson come out and play a little weird role. You know what I mean? Like, but I'm like, as far as it goes, we want guys in shootouts, right? And this week, that's that's the game, right? We want over unders that are like 50 that have spreads that are as close as possible. So, 50, one and a half, or whatever it is, with a two and a half point spread. That's the game. That's the game of the week. It's the Cowboys and the and the Bills. And shout out to the schedule this week because it's lining up nice. Three games on Saturday, 
full slate on at one o'clock. There's only three games at four o'clock, but the over unders for those games are all like fifty, right? You got like uh, the Rams and in Washington with a little hucky chuck it. You've got that game. Uh, what's the other one at four o'clock? There's all decent games, and then the night games are you know are great as well right so like you rate ravens and jaguars with playoff implications on the line and quietly this eagles seahawks game what's with the what's with the three and a half spread point spread on that leo well, i want to get your take on that dude are the that's eagles a, are the eagles that's frauds, weird, dude i think i think the eagles i think the eagles are frauds and i think seattle Oof. might take them down i think the defense Whoa. is falling, defense is falling apart at the worst possible time the only the great equalizer is I don't trust the quarterback situation in Seattle. So I think that could be, yes. you know, Eagles getting it done. But hey, that is going to be a lit crowd. Crazy. That is, it's going to be loud. It's going to be loud. Loud. Um, that's going to be a, that's going to be a very, very weird, weird tilting game. Yeah, there's a lot of games to be excited about. I'm really excited about that Detroit Denver game. I think that's going to be a really fun one on Saturday evening. But Coop, we're hitting the end of the line here. Who are your playoff flag plants? Flag plant a couple of guys that you think need to be in people's lineups that you think have the potential to help people win leagues. Yeah. I'll tell you right now. So I, I, I went through quick. I saw the question on there. I didn't even know what it meant, but I was like, I, I'm going to pick one in each position. I'm thinking to myself, like, all right, who are some guys that are, they, they, in my opinion, these guys should be in everyone's lineup, but I've gotten a start sit question on each one of these guys already this week. And we've talked about some of them to a certain degree, but at quarterback Dak Prescott down the stretch, man, like, these conditions, people talk about like tough matchups. You don't want cupcake matchups down the stretch, right? Like you don't want the possibility that the 49ers go into Arizona like they did earlier this year and Christian McCaffrey just scores three touchdowns and uh, and that's the whole game. And George Kittle does nothing and I does nothing, right? Like you want these shootouts. Dak Prescott, that schedule is tough, right? Like it's the Bills, it's the uh, Bills, Dolphins, Detroit, and I think this is a good football team, so I think they show up for all those games. I think we get shootouts in those games. So I'm liking Dak Prescott, uh, Sam Laporta, man. Sam Laporta coming on at the right time, and his schedule is great, dude. His schedule is great. One of the few guys that has three at least even or plus matchups. Uh, so that's my tight end. Uh, Michael Pittman is the wide receiver for me for my my flag plant there. Again, like you shouldn't, I shouldn't be getting questions on Michael Pittman, but I got two today. I've gotten two today. This guy plays every single snap. The RPO for that offense opens things up. They might even get Jonathan Taylor back. And he, he's an absolute focal point of the offense. And the last one, the last one of that, uh, you know, hopefully we can trust him. Arthur Smith coming around a little bit and he's using Drake London. He's using Kyle Pitts and he's using Bijan Robinson. Yes. yes. Bijan Robinson baby 56 snaps last week he's catching balls he's an amazing generational talent and thank goodness leo that this team is somehow leading the division right now what seven and six is leading the division so they're in it man they're in it to win it so there's no holding back now like all you have to do is make the tournament and then anything can happen the giants showed us that year that they they squeaked into the tournament and beat the patriots they did it twice they squeaked in got hot at the right time this team is leaning on their stars at the right time, and we're about to see down the stretch what Bijan can really do. Yeah, and it's funny. That Chicago-Atlanta game at the end of the season, that one I think could really be a tilting one for fantasy managers. A lot of guys that, that are going to have be in everybody's lineups, and I think that could be like a sneaky game that, that could go off. Coop, you were very generous with your time, very generous with your takes. Let everybody know where they can find your stuff once again. Yeah, absolutely. So at Coupe Fiasco on Twitter, if you just type in Fantasy Alarm Andrew Cooper, the little features tab comes up, you click that, and it's just everything I've written. Most of it's free. The only stuff that I do behind the paywall are the, you know, like the snap count article, my all my rank, my full rankings behind the paywall, but all my tight end stuff is there, both the weekly ones and the rest of the season. And also my my DFS stuff is behind the paywall. But again, that's you know, that's for the fantasy alarm members. But I always I love coming on here talking with you guys. Everything else I posted for the most part is free. So check it out at Kube Fiasco, the easiest way to get all that stuff, man. And uh, let me know what I got to do to finish up the season strong and break the record. If I got to go on and do another five-hour show with Matt Kelly to to get up there, then, you know, well, you got to do what you got to do, right? I never say never. We're going to get you booked on a couple of shows here. And then look for Coop, Billy Muzio, and I putting together a couple F FFPC playoff contest yes. shows upcoming uh, when we get to that. To that. But uh, yeah. We'll do a little home, awesome. little home and home on that. 
We'll do, home and home. You know what I mean? Well, home and we'll, do home. My, gonna... we'll, do, we'll do my promo code on my show, and then we'll come back on and we can do your promo code. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Everybody, uh, definitely check out First Class Fantasy tomorrow, three thirty Eastern Time, uh, with Billy Muzio and I. And then Friday, I have Alan Soslowski on Dynasty Life. This is the uh, the week to get it. Put a little extra time in on your lineup, start set decisions. We're at the end of the line. Time to win. Time to win some money. Time to win some championships. Have a great rest of your day. Hey, I want to take a moment to thank you for tuning in. It's important to me that all of our media be free. This is only possible because of you allowing a true independent sports media enterprise to thrive unlike any other in the business. So please subscribe to the All In Package to continue to make all this possible to ensure that all of our stats, information, data, content is available to you, especially you, the people that get the site and get the show.